So the other day I was just watching some videos and somebody actually sent me one and it was one of those videos that you can't not watch. <laughs> So naturally, I reposted the video, and in the caption I put, uh, this could have been me if I would have stayed in country bands longer. Because back in the day, I did play in a couple of country bands, and it sometimes got pretty wild like that. Then I had the idea of, why don't I just put out a video and tell you my journey as it pertains to drinking on stage, drinking while performing. But don't worry, because this is not going to be a lecture of any kind, and it's also not going to be some after-school special type thing. I don't want to tell people what to do with their own lives, you know, but I thought I could probably help some people people out if I at least tell my story. So here's the question. How does somebody who started off never drinking live, ever touching a drop on stage, how do you go from that to one day sleeping in the back of your car after a show, taking a long extended nap because you knew you were too buzzed to get behind the wheel? To answer that, I have to go all the way back to my teenage metal band. I know I talk about it all the time. But uh, here we are, four excited teenagers. We find out we're going to play an out-of-town gig with another band who are our friends. And we're actually going to spend the night at a hotel. Sounds like a recipe for some interesting things already, doesn't it? So we're all in a van driving to the show. And before we actually get to the venue, the driver takes a detour and takes us to a nearby liquor store. Now, by this time, we're all over 18, but the legal drinking age is 21. So I'm going to say this is all alleged. This is an alleged story. But a very close friend of the band said that he would actually go in the liquor store and get us whatever we wanted. We could each pick out one item. And this was weird for us because we weren't drinkers, you know. We were too busy trying to get good as a band. And we weren't like typical teenagers our age who partied all the time and were always around alcohol. So this was like a big deal to us. Plus, growing up, you know, watching all the bands that we idolized, a lot of those people were heavy drinkers, you know. I mean, our favorite band at the time was Metallica. And they drank so much that they were actually actually called alcoholica sometimes. We all ended up actually going into the liquor store and we're walking around the aisles looking at what to get. And you know, the other guys got pretty normal stuff like beer and one guy I believe got schnapps. Back then you had to have a bottle of schnapps. But I ended up choosing a bottle of Jack Daniels. It was like a plastic pint of Jack Daniels. And the guy that we were with was like, are you sure you want to get that stuff? That's pretty hardcore. And the reason I went right for the hard stuff for Jack Daniels is because I was basically raised on alcohol. You know, I didn't drink it myself, but my dad was a heavy beer drinker and I remember being eight years old and he went to the bathroom and I snuck a sip of his beer and I thought it was the grossest thing in the world. I was never destined to be a beer drinker, you know, but once my stepdad entered my life, he was kind of this really cool heavy metal Harley Davidson kind of guy and he had stacks of like Easy Rider magazines and I remember looking through them. I felt really naughty, you know, and there's like these pretty women on these motorcycles and then I saw the logo for Jack Daniels everywhere in the motorcycle world it seemed. So I grabbed my bottle of Jack Daniels off the shelf. Uh, our friend ended up getting it for us. We went out to the van and I remember there was like this buzz of excitement, like we're doing something naughty, but it's something that our idols do. So we're finally living the dream. We're finally doing it. I decided right away that I wasn't going to drink a drop until after our performance because uh, as a band, you know, we started really young around 14, 15 and we played with a lot of older bands and we saw pretty quickly the effect of alcohol. There was one time where we opened for a band and their guitar guitar player got so drunk that he couldn't even stand up like he was messing up all his guitar parts and all of a sudden I look over and he basically fell to the back wall and he was holding himself up by leaning on the back wall and that really stuck with me and we also played with a quite legendary band from Minneapolis who uh Minneapolis and St. Paul I should say that were notorious for being just insanely drunk on stage and were these young 15 year old 16 year olds you know looking up at these guys who we idolized and they're getting wasted on stage in fact, the sound guy actually would cover the monitors with plastic bags because he was ready for it. You know, spilled drinks, vomit, anything was on the table with this band. And in our little teenage metal band looking up to these guys, we saw some crazy stuff at a very young age. There was actually one show where they brought up strippers. But I won't go into it too much, but let's just say it changed our DNA for life after seeing that. So we played our set. It went pretty well. And then the uh, other band who were our friends, they headlined, they did really well. Afterwards, we all went to the hotel, you know, hotel after party. It's just what you imagine being in a band is like, we're all going to go party at the hotel. We're going to be crazy. And it was there where I finally cracked the seal on 
that bottle of Jack, and uh, I didn't really know how to drink at all. So I was just sipping out of it. You know, it was really pathetic. I could have mixed it with something. I could have put ice cubes in a glass and did the on the rocks thing. But no, I was just sitting there sipping it straight up. My drummer had bought a pack of Mickey's Big Mouths, and so he was over there sipping on his beer. And it was really a strange, you know, contrast because the band we were playing with, they were all older guys and they were used to partying and drinking. So they were being really chill. But because my band were so inexperienced in the drinking world, I noticed right away things were changing quickly. And I was feeling really strange. All the anxiety that I usually have whenever I'm in a group, you know, I'm very introverted. It just started to melt away. And it was a really wild feeling to experience that. Next thing I knew, I was just talking to people, people I didn't know, just openly, very comfortably as well. The guitar player for the other band had his sister there. And I just started talking to her. And before that, you know, I was pretty mortified talking to women. And I was just being, you know, really relaxed. And it was just such a different side to myself that I never knew existed. But uh, yeah, I just kept sipping out of that bottle. It lasted a long time, but it didn't take very many sips before I started to feel really crazy. I'd say we're about an hour into the party now, and I'm asking this girl to marry me. I kept saying, I'm going to marry you someday. Just marry me. And she just laughed it off, basically, and rolled her eyes like, you're just silly, Mike. What are you doing? And my drummer, who was drinking the Mickey's Big Mouths, uh, he started to, for some reason, have a problem with this other guy in the room. Seemingly for no reason. He just kept saying, I'm going to kick that Canadian guy's ass. And so I was kind of laughing about it because it just seems so silly. I'm like, what is your problem with this guy? You know, did he really want to kick the guy's ass? No. Was the guy even Canadian? I don't think so. But when you're young and so inexperienced with drinking, you just don't know what's coming out of your mouth when you're drunk. So there was never any fights. Uh, you know, I didn't get married, obviously. And we just had a fun night. The rest of the night was chill. The next morning I woke up with the uh, steel spike driven through my brain. At least it felt that way. So I had quite a bad hangover. But we were young. You know, that wore off really quick and what really stuck with me is how much fun we had so it got dangerous because I started to associate drinking with having a great time my teenage metal band would end up breaking up shortly after that time but uh, I never drank on stage with that band afterwards even even though you know I had that good experience I still equated being on stage and drinking to bad news some time had passed and eventually I found myself in a country rock band and this is really the first time where the idea of drinking on stage became normal for me uh, we were up there and we would play for three hours sometimes you know three one hour sets and I saw how much fun the other guys were having you know sipping beer and just chilling out and I thought okay maybe I can have one let's see what happens and I tried to drink beer but it made me want to run to the bathroom every 20 minutes so I give up that idea quick like I said earlier I'm just not meant to drink beer for some reason so I experimented a little bit and I ended up realizing that Captain Cokes were the thing for me at the time uh, I was already used to drinking pop we call it pop here in Minnesota I know it's soda but so I started asking for rum and cokes, you know, Captain Coke, if I had a few extra bucks. And uh, yeah, I really got hooked on the feeling of drinking one of those, uh, at least one or two per show. And it really made things fly by. You know, when you're playing friends in those places for the thousandth time, uh, being a little bit buzzed makes it a lot more fun. And it made the sets go by so quick. I didn't realize it, but I was setting myself up for a wicked trap, a really bad habit. And that's thinking of being on stage equals having to drink. So I sort of adopted what the other members were already doing. You know, it's hard to be the only one not drinking. And then when you feel that for the first time, it's really hard to go without it later on. I already talked about witnessing some really brutal booze stories when we were really young and watching the older bands. But now I was in those older bands. I was one of them. And I experienced a couple crazy things in this band. One time after an out of town show, we had to drive this gigantic trailer full of our gear to where we were staying and we had multiple vehicles and so the, one of the band members who was driving asked me if I would drive behind him and I didn't really know why he asked me that but I found out quick so it turns out he was really buzzed like I didn't realize that when I was talking to him because he's really good at hiding it and he started to drive and this truck is going back and forth he's just weaving from side to side and I thought I was going to witness my friend's death right there we ended up getting to our destination but I remember death gripping the wheel it was like that scene in planes trains and automobiles where all of a sudden you let go of the steering wheel and you don't realize how tight you were gripping it 
Anyhow, that band was a lot of fun, and I played with them for a while. But then it started to morph into different members, and uh, we became sort of a different band with a different name, but we still played country. And we had this regular gig at an out-of-town venue. It was just this small bar. And for the first time in my life, I really felt like music was becoming like a job, and I didn't like that feeling at all. It felt like work. I was pretty hard up for money back then, too, so, you know, I was depending on this gig as well, so I couldn't just quit. So after our 10th gig or so, you know, things are getting really routine. Uh, I still was drinking rum and Cokes, Captain Cokes, whatever. And there was one time halfway through the show, I was on my second drink and the singer went to order his drink from the stage. And he said, you know what? Can you bring up a B-52? And I'm like, that sounds kind of interesting. You know, I'm like, get me one too. What the heck? You know? So she came up and gave me both my drinks, you know, the rum and Coke and the B-52. And when I started to drink the B-52, my mind shifted a little bit. It was such a great combination. It was like a coffee liqueur mixed with Grand Marnier. So it was really sweet, but it was warm at the same time. And it went down like old school NyQuil, you know, before they changed the formula. And I actually felt like I was on NyQuil right afterwards, minus the sleepiness. Well, I felt so good after that drink, I didn't even mind playing Chattahoochee. I thought, this is fun, man. I'm having a great time. So naturally, I ordered another one. And that was my fatal flaw for that night. I had never had that much to drink at one time, and I felt it. Towards the end of the show, I didn't think I was going to make it. But as soon as we hit the last note, I put my guitar down, and I made a beeline for the bathroom. The other band members kind of laughed because, you know, they're seasoned and pros, you know, they've been drinking for decades. And this is like my first time feeling sick from alcohol. So I went to the bathroom, all four drinks plus the basket of chicken fingers came out. <laughs> I don't think I ever threw up that hard. And when I finally came out of the bathroom, my friend who was the bass player and singer, he was like trying to make me feel better, even though the drummer was kind of still laughing in the background. And he's like, is that the first time you ever threw up from booze? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, that's always rough. He's like, it probably felt like your boots were going to come up, right? After that, I avoided drinking B-52s mixed with rum and Cokes, and I found out that whiskey was a good drink for me. For some reason, it just worked with my body chemistry. Uh, I could drink it throughout the night slowly, and I just felt like I was always on like this even keel. This was around the time that I joined another band. This was more like a variety band. They played pop, rock stuff. We had a female singer, and we were all good friends. And because we're all good friends, you know, we felt like we were always hanging out, partying, so naturally drinking became part of our equation as a band. We even had a drink that we claimed as our own owned for our band. And that was where you take Jägermeister and mix it with Red Bull. And they would call them Jäger bombs. We just called them Jäg bombs. But sometimes we do like a ceremonial Jäg bomb shot before we started the show. And then usually before the last set, we would do another one. It got pretty insane because Jägermeister makes me forget things and also makes me feel numb. So that didn't always work out because I had to play keyboards and guitars. And just like the other bands, we had our fair share of crazy booze moments. So one time after our show, a couple of the band members were pushing the PA speakers up the ramp into the trailer and they would use a dolly and I remember one of the band members felt a little bit courageous and he was going to do it by himself and he was you know half in the bag if not almost all the way in the bag he starts pushing it up and then he slips and the dolly falls and the huge PA speaker actually tumbles I remember it was like slow motion tumbled over our drummer and somehow he did not get hurt some people call that like drunk dumb luck it's hard to explain it but it's almost like because they're not overthinking they just naturally flow with things sometimes and they avoid injury in the craziest way another time is when a band member was on a bar stool trying to get down the banner from behind the drum kit which was already on this big drum riser so he was standing up pretty high we're all just kind of talking and packing up our stuff when we hear this loud crash and I look over and I see our banner is just hanging off by by one pin at the top and we couldn't see our band member who had fallen to the ground until his head popped up over the edge and we're just like oh my god are you okay once again saved by drunk dumb luck and I think the reason he avoided injury is because he never tensed up because he was so drunk he wasn't even aware that he was falling kind of like the guy in the beginning of my video so he hit the ground almost like a judo expert you know so he just popped up and he was fine it was kind of miraculous after a while, I had to quit that band, and even though I needed the money at the time, I knew it was better for my health and, you know, mental health and physical health if I just cooled it for a while. You know, it was just getting out of hand, out of control. But like most musicians, you know, after a while, you get a little bit uh, reminiscent. You start to think about the good times versus the bad stuff. And I eventually dipped my toe back into playing live. And this time it came in the form of a tribute band. Well, it didn't take very long. I mean, our first gig was at this kind of smaller bar. I mean, the banner behind us was a Jägermeister banner. And before I knew it, you know, all the associations came back. I'm like, okay, fun, 
playing live shows, great times, drinking. And so before I knew it, I was having a drink next to me all the time on stage again. So this moderate way of drinking while I played went on for many years with this band. But I believe for me, it got the worst when we started to play out of town shows. You know, we had a couple casino gigs now where we'd spend the night. And that seems to be a recipe for disaster for me, at least when I know I don't have to drive home. You could just go completely crazy. We drank a little bit on stage. We kept it together pretty well. We always wanted to represent this band really well. But afterwards, you know, when we got back to the casino hotel, things got pretty wild. Waiting for us in one of the rooms was one of those gallon-sized whiskey bottles, you know, the kind with the actual handle on it. So that's when I knew this was going to be a wild night. You get talking, you order some pizza, next thing you know, everybody's just lit up like crazy. And uh, nothing really terrible happened that night, but uh, I remember getting in a small argument with my drummer, which was uncharacteristic of both of us. So we both knew, you know, we were just not in our right minds, but still. And then I ended up like trying to teach everybody jujitsu. It was just a weird thing. This is water, I swear to God. It looks like wine or something, but it's water. That'd be kind of ironic if I was drinking wine while making this video, right? So the reason I say this was my worst time uh, is because the next morning I woke up and this time I felt like I had two spikes in my brain. And uh, all I wanted to do was sleep. The checkout time was 10 a.m. And I actually called down to the lobby and I was actually going to pay for a whole nother night there just to get a few extra hours of sleep because I knew I couldn't get up before 10. I was just dead to the world. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to think of it, the lady at the desk was very agitated. And she's like, if you want to stay for another night, you're going to have to come down here in person and actually fill things out and, uh, you know, give me your credit card and all that kind of stuff. So I was pretty mad at this point, but I'm glad it happened because it drove me to my edge. You know, drove me to my breaking point where I thought, I have to change. You know, I can't keep doing this. That hour long drive home was one of the worst things I've ever experienced. You know, I was just dead. And I had to pull down the uh, sun visor and there wasn't even sun in my eyes because everything just felt so bright. But after I went home and took a five hour nap, I woke up determined to change how I do things. I thought, I can't keep doing this. I keep falling back into the same, you know, trap every single time I start to play live again. So I just made a few rules right off the bat. I thought, okay, I'm going to just try to do one drink per set. And we would play shows where we'd have two sets. And so two drinks in a long four hour night was not nearly as bad as what I was doing. So I felt pretty good about that. I felt like I was going the right direction. And yes, I deviated from that sometimes, but uh, I really tried to hold strong to that rule. And my eventual goal is to not drink at all at shows. I would love to just sip water, you know, during a performance and somehow get my nervous energy, my anxieties out a different way. For me, just having a quick whiskey helps that a ton. Whereas other people, you know, other musicians have other ways to chemically impair themselves. That helps. But I would really love to just do it the, the real way and just get over it naturally. My ultimate goal is to do a follow-up video to this one someday where I just say I'm free and clear. You know, I don't drink anymore at shows. I feel like like I don't need it anymore. I found a way to just chill out and relax and enjoy the music. I let the music intoxicate me. I don't know what I'll say, but we'll see. So thank you for watching. If you have any stories you want to tell me in the comment section about your experience with drinking and performing, that would be awesome to hear. But either way, we'll see you at the next video. Thank you. Bye-bye.